Welcome to the OVC Oral History Project. Thank you. Jim, could you just please state your name and spell it for yes, me? Yes, my name is James Rowland. That's R-O-W-L-A-N-D. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Jim, you're known as the father of the victim impact statement. Mm -hmm. Where did you get the idea and how did it all happen? Well, my uh, career started as a deputy sheriff for San Bernardino County. And for some reason, after a year, I ended up in the detective division and was involved in several cases that uh, uh, domestic violence, rape, murder, child abuse. Uh, and I was amazed to learn the, and I didn't have the term immediately, the impact that crime had on so many people, mm -hmm. serious impact. I saw a woman killed by a drunk driver, a head-on collision. The child came through the windshield, and as I ran up to the door, she was taking her last breath. And I was very young, <laughs> fresh out of college, and just had a lot of influence on me. And I reflected. I said, neither my department nor my four years of college ever dealt with victim issues. And I didn't understand that, because it was so devastating at times. And the term impact was not the original term that I had, but my dad was a builder. And he was frequently complaining about environmental impact. Mm. And years later, uh, I guess I reflected on that. And when I was, at that time of being a deputy sheriff, I said, if I'm ever in a position to focus more on what crime really does to people, uh, I'll do something about it. Years later, I ended up as a probation officer in Fresno and the term victim impact statement was born there, going back to my early years as a law enforcement officer and my dad complaining about an environmental impact statement. And what actually happened? What was the story of the creation when you were a probation officer? I met a, uh, when I went to uh, Fresno as chief probation officer, Judge Kenneth Andreen, uh, we became very close and he was talking about how the victim is neglected and uh, the justice system is doing nothing for victims. So the victim impact statement discussion came a little earlier, but basically most of the discussion in Fresno was about both victim impact and probation-based victim services to assist them. We were able to hire some staff that worked exclusively with victims. And the victim impact statement was simply, uh, simply uh, two or three paragraphs in the pre-sentence report. That's before the victim actually came to court and could testify, so it was in our pre-sentence report. Tell me about the ACA Task Force on Victims of Crime. One of the uh, beautiful things about the business is the uh, passionate, dedicated people that work in this field, and uh, I think 12 or 15 of us came together at ACA. The, at that time, the ACA was examining policy and procedures about a whole range of correctional and probation topics. And I frankly don't know whose idea it was to have a task force on uh, victim issues. Certainly Sharon English was right there and Ann was there. And uh, it became a very uh, hardworking group that produced uh, some policy statements that uh, ended up in ACA publication. I think we met a half a dozen times at various conferences and uh, it was fun and uh, helped us focus on the needs of victims. And, and what year was that, that it started? Ooh, I want to say mid 80s, 87, 86, somewhere in there. Mm -hmm. Well, little, we've sort of already touched on this with the impact statement, but in general, how or why did you first get involved in the crime victims movement? To bring to the attention, I've, I've been in the criminal justice system all my life and always worked with dedicated people. Good people come into the police work, probation work, parole work, prison work. But uh, I simply wanted to uh, spread the word and influence if I could. The fact that crime does more and cause a victim to fill out an insurance form. For some victims, it's a matter of inconvenience. For other victims, it's a life-changing experience. 
And based on my observation and experience in the 50s, I simply felt a need to uh, share that information and have it become more influential and not have victims just exhibits for evidence. I wanted people to know that there was a lot of pain and a lot of people were hurt. I brought a poster today you may show later. Uh, I've been very fortunate to uh, have some tremendous staff and I asked Jim Macy and Owen Putler after a lunch with Judge Kenneth Andreen start thinking about what we might be doing for victims and they came up with a poster that expanded my knowledge. I knew there were psychological and financial impact and I, I was thinking of the primary victim but they came up with a poster that showed yes there's financial there's psychological but there's also informational needs and attitudinal needs and that there's more there are more victims than just the primary victim there's the victim's family and the offender's family and the employer and others and I just uh, as again based on my early experience I wanted to be a, a catalyst to help get that word out that did there's more to crime than a stolen car did you feel like you were working in a vacuum at that time it was lonely yes it was very lonely at that time we uh, we were able to put on a workshop in Fresno based on some uh, a grant we got from the Lilly Foundation and learned that there were quite a few people from around the United States once that workshop occurred I knew that there were a lot of people interested in this field but until that workshop and I forget the year I think it was the mid 70s uh, it was it seemed a little lonely mm -hmm. yes could you describe the field of victims rights and services 30 years ago um, in the context of what you were doing the uh, the justice system representatives without meaning to treated victims with lack of respect uh, as I mentioned earlier, they were viewed as Exhibit A or Exhibit B. And if they were not needed for testimony or evidence, they were excluded. They were nothing. And uh, I can remember cases of burglary where the family would be sitting at home worried that the burglar might come back. In reality, the burglar had been arrested and because of a plea bargain, no trial, sentenced to jail or prison, no one took the time to tell the victim that their case had been <laughs> solved, that the burglar was gone or dealt with. And uh, they were, without meaning, again, I'm not putting down the justice system people because they've been super people. The victims were neglected. They were ignored. They were uh, sometimes a source of frustration if the victims were too aggressive and wanting to know what happened. Victims want information. They deserve and need information. That's probably their number one need. What's going on? So it was a, uh, the victims were neglected and uh, without meaning to do so, they were abused in my opinion. In your pioneering area of victim assistance, what was the greatest challenge that you and your colleagues have faced in, effective ch in effecting change? We, uh, early on in Fresno became very collaborative. Fortunately, we had representatives from the justice system and in my opinion, <laughs> brilliantly, somebody said let's get the community involved too. So we had a very influential, popular minister in Fresno chair our task force and uh, that really opened up doors. Some of the judges were already interested. Uh, one of the things we didn't work as hard on as we should have, as soon as we should have, was informing elected officials what we were doing. And that created some minor obstacles. But uh, because we were collaborative with community involvement, uh, things went fairly easily compared to other states or other jurisdictions because you were, you were able to engage the community in this fairly quickly? Very quickly, not only engage the community, but uh, as I said, the chair of our task force was from the community, so the community was involved up front. It wasn't just sharing, it was involvement. And that's one of the great needs, continue I think, is not just collaborative program development or collaborative program management. We need collaborative ownership, that this is a community project, including business community, 
faith-based community, uh, professional organization. It needs to be very broad-based ownership. And we had some of that in the early days in Fresno. It seems like the also the need was clearly articulated as well. Yes, I think so. Yeah. Because we had public defender, district attorney, community members and that knew of the situation. So it wasn't like uh, trying to educate people that didn't know the consequences of crime. They were aware of the consequences without really converting it into service, a service delivery system. Were there tactics, secrets, strategies that you employed that were successful? The w yes, the one I already mentioned was that we did not do it, we did not do our thing in probation. It was collaborative from day one. Once we got the poster that I'll show you later, uh, I think that was that was what made us successful in Fresno. It was not our program or Jim Rowland's effort. It was a community justice system effort. I just can't stress that enough. And uh, if there were any secret tactics, which it wasn't a secret tactic, mm -hmm. that was the magic that made it, uh, oh, I think helped us be one of the first probation department to actually have full-time staff working exclusively with victims. Would you like to look at the poster now, um, or would you rather well, we talk wait. about it later? Talk about it later. Okay. Where, where do you see that there have been failures in the victims' rights movement that you would consider important? I think, I don't know if I want to call it failure, but disappointments, uh, right, not, not so much rivalry among various victim organizations, but the lack of coordination, the lack of core values, uh, rivalry. There is, there, to me, in my opinion, to this day, there is no uniform philosophy. We hear the term restorative justice, and some people think that's soft on crime. Some victim organizations think that restorative justice is being soft on crime. And that's simply not true. But uh, I think the shortcomings is uh, the lack of coordination, the lack of core values, the lack of philosophical principles that the whole field helps develop and buy into. Can you think of a specific example? I mean, not sort of necessarily talking about people or uh, situations where um, the lack of coordination or the sort of the turf issues have, have, have weakened the movement. Well, I, again, if you consider restorative justice, restorative justice says that crime is not just against the state, it's against human beings and human relationships and that society has a responsibility to assist and restore the victim, we also have a responsibility to use the punishment accountability process as a time to try to educate and train the offender to prevent future victimization. Uh, a couple victim groups in California worked real hard to prevent some legislation relating to offender education. I would use that as a, a fairly recent example. The, you know, the recidivism rate in the nation is in excess of 70 percent. So at the time we're punishing offenders, we should do something to correct and educate, which is one of the mandates of restorative justice. But the victim, a uh, couple victim organizations were successful in stopping a pretty good initiative because they didn't see how that affected the victim's movement. It prevents future victimization is what it does. So I, I think that's the most recent example I can think of is that uh, our lack of core values, our lack of understanding of the long-range consequences of crime sometimes prevents collaborative effort among state organizations. Do you see uh, ways of resolving that, or is it more a process of evolution? I think it's, it's evolution with some political leadership. We need some elected officials that would uh, host or rally or convene uh, those types of opportunities for people to uh, learn and discuss and share among organizations. What do you perceive to be the one greatest accomplishment that has promoted victims' rights and needs? I can't, I can't reduce it to one, in, uh, one effort. Uh, the, uh, 
I think the thing that helped the most in terms of elected officials was when the states, including California, started passing victim rights initiatives. I think that captured uh, the attention of elected officials probably more than any other single thing. But uh, when I think back to the 50s and 60s and see where we are today, it's hard for me to think failure because we've come so far. We have a long way to go, a long way to go. But we've come so far, so I'd, it's hard for me to really embrace failure. But uh, uh, I think the, the initiatives captured the attention more than any other thing in a positive way. Are there, um, do you want to talk about the, the victim impact statement and how it's affected um, the system in terms of It had a lot of work. impact. It had a lot of impact. Uh, it influenced the decisions. The re it influenced the recommendations of probation officers. It influenced the decisions of judges, some public defenders, not ours in Fresno because he was on our committee and was all for it. Some public defenders were very unhappy with impact statements because they were influential. In fact, I don't know, maybe people don't f didn't know or have forgotten, the issue of victim impact statements were appealed all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, and the court upheld it, of course, but uh, the victim impact statement had a lot of influence in the early days. And I think it influenced services. I think preparing the impact statement and really learning some of the consequences of crime helped and influenced many people to move toward a, d a service delivery system. Some of the people that we've been speaking to on this oral history over the last few days have said that it's one of the most important aspects, uh, one of the most important developments in the victims' rights movement is, is the victim impact Good. statement. Glad to hear that. It's relevant. It was, uh, it certainly had early on influence in our justice system in Fresno. What is needed today to continue the growth and professionalism of our field? And also, what would you say is missing? We need, uh, and maybe some work's been done on this that I'm not aware of, but we need some principles, core values for the whole victim's field, not just one organization. <coughs> Excuse me. We need some values and principles. I think medicine, law, have their values and principles, teaching. The victim's movement needs some values that we all embrace, whether we work on all of them or not. And uh, I think we need more study and research on the long-range impact of crime. I think there's more impact there than we realize for some victims. I witnessed one execution in California and the sisters and nieces the man being put to death was present and uh, to meet them and hear them and to hear their sobbing uh, it will affect them for life the execution part will and the brothers of the victim who was murdered and who was raped and murdered they were at the same in the same room and uh, I think we need yes for some people having their car stolen is a two-week inconvenience the insurance company helps them. But if you're a single parent and you don't have any insurance and your car is stolen, and you need to get to work, there's more impact. And, and for some people, uh, crime is devastating. And I think we as a profession need more study, evaluation, and research on what impact does for some victims. Um, when you talk about core values, are you thinking in terms of a code of ethics for the field or could you could you mention some of the values you I'm think thinking, are really critical I'm thinking maybe values and principles and uh, restorative justice I think we need to say yes victims are impacted and they need assistance service and healing Offenders need accountability, but they too need assistance. And that would be a value to me, that the justice system has responsibility to do both. 
not just to assist the victim and then let the prisoner sit in idleness for five years and come out of prison worse. So that would be, a, I would hope that could be someday be a victim movement value, that there's some attention and focus, and that both are important, that victims today need to work to prevent victimization on others in the future, and that gets you into the offender business. Any other values that uh, beyond restorative justice that you think are critical? I think those are the main ones I'm interested in uh, that come to mind. Certainly a value that says uh, the assistance is based on, for victims, based on some assessment and that it may go on for a long time and not just short-term assistance. Again, based on the impact. I, I've known of uh, women that were afraid to leave their home years after their home being broken into they were afraid it'd be broken into again and that they may come in when the burglars in the home years later. So th that, uh, that should not be 90 days counseling. That needs to be some long range assistance there. We have a lot of professionals and volunteers who've joined the field in the last 10 years who uh -huh. haven't gone through this process and benefited from all of the, benefited from the, the stages that the movement has gone through. What advice would you give them? To work to uh, clarify their own values and their own purposes and to work hard for collaborative ownership and not just do their thing or their program. Collaborative ownership will help ensure the future, I think. And to not neglect themselves. Get training, listen to peers. Could you be more specific? Um, in terms of the, if you were, if you were standing in front of a, a group of um, young uh, victim assistance providers that have just mm -hmm. graduated from the State mm -hmm. Academy and they're sending out and you're there to, to give them their graduation message mm -hmm. and you're going to push collaboration, mm -hmm. what, what would you suggest to them? I would to tell do? them to work hard, to keep uh, improving themselves, that learning and education is a lifelong process. But remember, you're not in it alone. And the more people that own the program you're working toward or working on, the greater survival, flexibility, and to uh, don't work just to do your thing. Work to do our thing. And uh, you'll not only do better, but you'll be more uh, satisfied in your endeavor. <coughs> Excuse me. Do you have a vision for the field? My vision for the field would pretty well be wrapped up in uh, some of the principles I talked about with restorative justice. I think our society needs to give equal attention to victims and to the people that are victimizing. I'm uh, bothered by the lack of corrective action for offenders. In our state alone, I'm not criticizing anybody. I think 50% of them are sitting in idleness. And we know from other studies that engaging offenders in various programs, accountability and work, uh, can change their lives. We've learned that with drug addicts in this state and others. Intervention works for offenders. And you're preventing, future, you're preventing domestic violence and child abuse and homicide if you can turn the lives of offenders around. We can do it, but it's not a high priority. So my vision would be, let's give equal attention. Yes, let's help victims survive the criminality, and let's work with that offender to see that they don't try to, that they don't do it again. And it does work. I still believe strongly that nine out of 10 prisoners or offenders can change their lives and become responsible citizens. I've seen it, I, I just know it can happen. I don't have a lot of research to back it up, but I just feel that we're not being fair to victims or taxpayers not to try to change the lives of offenders. Do you think that victim services and corrections is, has a lot of drive behind it currently, and, that will, con and will that continue to grow? I think it would help if there were more uh, members of the legislature knowledgeable and helpful. Uh, any program development activity has its ups and downs. 
and because of what's going on in our state, I think it's down a little bit right now. I'm hopeful that it'll come back, but uh, I think the budget crisis in our state and in various counties is going to slow things down a little bit. But uh, I'm optimistic that with victim organizations working together and pushing and working with their elected officials that uh, it'll be back. What's your greatest fear for the field? That we will uh, remain fragmented and not develop information that will help it grow in the future. I think fragmentation, lack of coordination, and lack of research makes me lose a little bit of sleep at night. Jim, you were the first president of NOVA. How has the field changed since the beginning of NOVA? Can, and can you just talk about some of the people, um, the major players that you feel were involved in significant changes in the field? Yeah, I, I don't remember exactly the years I was president, but I was not the first president no. of NOVA. <laughs> we uh, got a grant from the Lilly Foundation and brought 30 or 40 people to Fresno. And out of that, there had already been one conference a year before, I think in Florida. Some of the same people came to Fresno. And I wish I could remember all 40 of their names, but uh, it was during that time that the thought of a national organization came into existence. I think I was the second or third president. But uh, certainly uh, Marlene Young and John Stein, Frank Carrington, spent many, many hours, many days with Frank Carrington, and uh, he was an influential person in my frame of reference. But, uh, and then I think I met Ann in the 80s. <laughs> How did you all meet and come together for the first NOVA meeting? I mean, what, what, was, the, what was the context that, that you found each other and said, you know, we have to work on this? Yeah. There was a victim program in St. Louis, Missouri, I think. And I forget how I, I, I think maybe it goes back to Jim Macy and Owen Puddler <coughs> in their research for the victim impact statement, <coughs> excuse me, and victim services. They made a lot of phone calls, wrote a lot of letters, and came up with some of those names. And they helped me come up with the invitation list to invite to Fresno for the Lilly Foundation funded workshop. And a lot of those people, uh, had met a year earlier in Florida, but uh, it was through that early work that we came up with those names. And uh, how this, uh, I think the, uh, the field has become more ambitious as they realized the excellent work that was, they were doing. And uh, I think in the early 70s, there were no victim organizations in California. And I think the last time I checked, there were 25 or 30. So it's just been an uh, evolutionary process as people have learned the impact of crime. Do you remember what the agenda was of that first meeting? It was to get acquainted, to hear the speaker from uh, St. Louis. I'm blocking on her name, I apologize for that. It was to, uh, our agenda in Fresno was just to uh, let Fresno know that uh, we were moving in the right direction. We could not find a lot of programs. That's why the lady from St. Louis was very uh, well received. The Pastor G.L. Johnson, who chaired our task force, chaired the workshop. So uh, it was kind of a, st uh, a timely step. Not only helped a few others around the country, I think, but it was very influential in Fresno to host this workshop. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's just more and more people. It's more diverse now. More disciplines are involved. And uh, many, many specialized programs. Can you talk, talk to me a little bit about the, the first impact statement? How, what, what was the process the, those first few times that you put it into action? The, uh, the probation officers assigned to the court unit would, uh, before that time, it was optional whether the victim, unless there was missing property or some evidence that needed to be returned or uh, some other reason. Often the victim wasn't even included in the investigatory process, but with the impact statement, victims were consulted, 
and there was more discussion than just the circumstances of the crime. How much was the TV that was stolen? It was broader than that. And we learned the children would sit home in fear having their television stolen, not worried about the TV, but worried about the person coming back. So I think the court unit, and it just became an important section in the pre-sentence report, and they interviewed and approached victims differently because now we were talking impact, not just the immediate loss of property. Who did you, who did you assign to go out and take the first imp impact statements? I don't remember the individual. We had five or six probation officers assigned to the court unit, so all of them did that to some degree. But did you, were they, um, did they have an, an inkling about sensitivity to victims? Oh, I think so, yeah. yes. And uh, that was evolutionary. Yeah. The more victims we worked with, the more aware we became that we were not only moving in the right direction, but here's some people that are hurt more than we realize, and they're going to be hurting for a long time. That, I think, influenced our emphasis on developing services. It wasn't too long after the victim impact statement that we had staff working to assist victims in counseling, compensation forms, recovery of property, what have you. We just started viewing victims differently. W probation, like the rest of the justice system, just didn't really consider victims very much until that time. So, mm -hmm. so the dynamics of uh, information and knowledge and sharing influenced our operations. What did the judges have to say that were uh, looking they were They were supportive from day one. Yeah. It was one of the judges. He did not uh, initiate the victim impact statement, but he said we need to be doing more for victims. And he had talked about inviting some victims, that he had invited some victims to court to have them just to observe the process, whether their testimony was needed or not, mm -hmm. and how positive he felt about that. So the uh, I think at that time there were 12 judges in Fresno. All of them were supportive without question. The only hesitation or debate was with elected officials who saw probation moving in a new direction. And that's what we all need to do is work earlier and harder to inform the key elected decision makers as to what's going on. Um, when did the <coughs> victim impact statement become part of the law in California? Ooh. I'm sorry, Sharon is not here. No, uh, Proposition Eight in California made mm -hmm. it part of the law. So that was early '80s, I think. I forget when Prop Eight passed. But by that time, had it become a common tool across the state? In several in several counties, yes. Mm -hmm. We were visited by many many probation departments, and they uh, got the information and started using it. Yes, many st counties were using victim impact statements prior to Prop Eight. Mm -hmm. Are there any people or stories that, that come to mind that really just nailed it, how important it was that the uh, impact statement was part of the pre-sentence report and was got, got to the judge's attention? None in Fresno that I recall. I'd say it became fairly common quite early. Uh, what really reinforced th thinking not so much the written impact statement, but the right of victims to come to court and testify. It's a young lady out of Salinas, California, by the name of Cheryl Ward. I've spent a lot of time with Cheryl, whose husband was murdered and her daughter raped. And uh, it meant so much to her to be included and to influence <laughs> and to be heard and the way she describes it in a very articulate way. She'll be a speaker in L.A. next month at a conference on restorative justice. Uh, that's the most dramatic. And she recently met with the, one of the prisoners in California that uh, was involved in her husband's crime. And uh, it just, I think it gives dignity and respect and uh, importance to someone to listen to victims and let them be included in the process, whether it turns out the way they want or not. Just the fact that somebody respected them enough to consider them means an awful lot to victims. But I can't think of one case in Fresno that uh, comes close to Cheryl Ward's case. Are there any other points that you'd really like to make that I haven't, 
that we haven't brought up in our series of questions yet? I think uh, you've been very thorough. <laughs> I think I just want to stress again that uh, people that really care about victims, and a lot of people do, they will also give some attention to the people that are causing the victimization and try to turn their lives around and invest some resources and energy and political effort to uh, deal with the people that we know are going to be causing seven out of ten are going to make more victims and uh, we can't lock them all up forever even though <laughs> some places we try sometimes I think the point I would make is if you really care for victims you'll try to prevent future victimization do you see that as also um, uh, an education for our communities as a whole it's more than education. It, it's certainly a step one, but it's involvement. I belong to a church in Fresno, and um, very conservative. And we ended up inviting some former prisoners to a workshop. And it was amazing to watch the dynamics of how their atti the attitudes of the church folks changed toward these folks. They wanted to, well, to make a long story short, they just... Uh, became advocates for them. The first time that uh, Doris Tate went to one of California's prisons, she brought in several ladies from uh, Parents of Murdered Children to meet with a dozen or so women that were doing life in prison for murder. Of course, the warden and many people were quite concerned about that, but it, it turned out to be unbelievably positive. And uh, Doris Tate made sure all the prisoners had an opportunity to tell their story. Some of the women were victims of domestic violence. So it, it humanized. Maybe that's one of the key things we need to be working on, is humanizing the justice system that includes victims, their families, and offenders and their families. Is it breaking down something of the polarization that naturally exists between offenders and victims? Yes, where there's actually information and exposure and discussion and communication, uh, it affects the attitudes on both sides. The, uh, this meeting I mentioned with Doris Tate was an all-day meeting at one of the women's prisons. And the attitudes of the prisoners, I know, were different after that, as well as the attitudes of the parents of murdered children were different. Yes, it, it, it humanizes things. It puts a, a face before the story. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you for this project. You're welcome. Are you ready? Okay, yeah. Ready to go? So, let, let's talk about this chart. This was made in the early 70s? Yes, I, uh, had, I was now working in Fresno, and Judge Kenneth Andreen had encouraged that we start looking about what we might do for victims. So I use this as a leadership example. I brought in two staff and put them on full-time special assignment, Owen Puddler and Jim Macy. Mm -hmm. And that's good leadership, in my opinion, is point of direction to get others involved to help determine how we're going to get there. And uh, this was one of the charts that Puddler and Macy brought back to me after a couple months. I was not surprised by the psychological and financial impact, but they listed informational impact. The need for information, this is needs, uh, the need for information. And it, it's true, we've learned that that's one of the greatest needs for some victims. So they, uh, staff exceeded what I expected. And they not only outlined the needs, but they expanded the whole concept in my mind of victims. Yes, there's a primary victim, but there's also some other victims. The victim's family, the offender's family, the employer, uh, sometimes bystanders victimized to some degree so uh, I've been very impressed with this chart as it ex expanded my concept of victim advocacy and it served as a good reminder if you get good staff involved like Sharon English and Sandy Menifee uh, frequently they will exceed all expectations that you had in mind when you gave them the original assignment I see going across the top that there are senior citizens, witnesses, innocent bystanders, the primary victim, mm -hmm. family of the accused, yeah, right. family of the primary victim, mm -hmm. innocent accused, mm -hmm. 
employer of accused and employer of victim. They're all impacted to various degrees. And that was new, that was good information for me. I was only thinking of the primary victim mm -hmm. when I gave him this assignment. And I was thinking of psychological and financial. So they expanded my concept of victim advocacy. And they, uh, they did that. Some of the results, lack of self-identification, confusion, mm -hmm. lack of understanding of resources, mm -hmm. loss of time, production, job, confusion, mm -hmm. three governmental procedures, right. attitude conducive to victimization, mm -hmm. and lack of community understanding. Mm -hmm. Now I went to, I uh, graduated with a degree in criminology, studied crime for four years. None of this was discussed in any criminology classes. I've checked, I can't find the word victim in any of those criminology books. So that's what I say, we've come a long way. Mm -hmm. So there's, while there's bumps in the road, there's no reason to be discouraged. We need to be celebrating <laughs> with the progress that's been made. It's tremendous. Great.